Russell, thank you very much indeed for that. I, I'm aware that your report is, is widely been circulated already, and I'm sure this group today will take it even further. I think we're in an interesting phase in this whole thing where, in fact, the whole principle of child poverty is up in the forefront of people's minds, and we need to keep it there. I suggest if there are some questions for Russell, we take them at the end after we've dealt with the panel, and we might, if there are some questions, you can bring them in as well. I'd now like to introduce the panel, uh, the business panel. Uh, we have four members of that, uh, and I'd like to come up individually. David McLean, currently head of the Westpac Institutional Bank, has been head uh, since 2004. And in his pre-banking life, David works as a lawyer in private practice. He serves on the boards of the New Zealand US Council and the New Zealand Institute for the Study of Competition and Regulation. And next month, unfortunately, as far as we're concerned, is leaving New Zealand to take up the role of Westpac Head of Americas in New York. David has been a tremendous supporter of, this, of our, the foundation and indeed of what work is going on in South Auckland. Our second panelist is Frank Porter. Frank is a senior partner in the commercial, commercial law firm Buddle Finley, which has offices in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. <coughs> Frank has been practicing law for over 30 years and is currently chairman of the Buddle Finley Child Health Foundation, which is a charitable trust set up by Buddle Finley to manage its contribution to child health <coughs> throughout New Zealand. And again, I say Buddle Finley through Frank Porter has been enormously supportive of the work that's been going on in, the, in this community. Our next panelist is Jocelyn Moore from the Stevenson's Foundation. Jocelyn is, one of Jocelyn's roles within the family owned Stevenson group of companies is trustee of the Stevenson Foundation, which was set up by her grandfather, Sir William Stevenson. Sir William was a strong supporter in the health sector, enabling the set up of the chairs of ophthalmology, orthopedics and plastics, and reconstructive surgery in the early 1970s, which the foundation still supports. The family and the foundation have continued Sir William's health sector support, particularly in the South Auckland region, and especially here at Middlemore Hospital, in all areas, from the construction of Kids First to funding specialised instruments, equipment and research. This current generation are continuing the family legacy with the support of the Stevenson Professor of Health, Innovation and Improvement, which is currently held by Professor Jonathan Gray, who's Director of Karatea. Finally, I'd like to welcome Dr. Alan Freeth, Chief Executive Officer of Telstra Clear. Alan joined Telstra Clear as its Chief Executive Officer in 2005 and previously held senior executive positions at Trustbank and Wrightson. He holds a PhD in population genetics from the Australian National University, a Bachelor of Science Honours from Canterbury University and an MBA. Alan is presently a director of the boards of Save the Children and Film New Zealand a member of the Global Agenda Council of the World Economic Forum on Next Generation and a trustee of Crime Stoppers New Zealand. I may say I thank you, Alan, for at the last moment having your arm twisted to join the, the board. <laughs> There's been a few of that in the last little while. I thank you to all of your, for you for joining us today and I'll ask you to uh, do a small presentation and if we may start, I'd ask David McLean to do the first presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Um, if I could just say it is inspiring to be here among so many wonderful people making a real difference to society. And I could also say that I, as a banker, I feel quite out of place. But um, perhaps I could just tell you from, uh, from the perspective of Westpac, which is a reasonably big business, the journey we've gone on um, in the last uh, couple of decades really to take us where we are today. First of all, I should say that Westpac, as you probably know, and as Grant, I think, alluded to, is an Australian bank. Uh, but we have been here in New Zealand for 151 years. Um, we bank about a million Kiwis, or provide financial services, including insurance and KiwiSaver and various things, to a million Kiwis. And because of our history, including um, being formed from, partly from Trust Bank, we have a bigger share of less well-off Kiwis than some other banks. Um, 20 years ago, we, we first began thinking about taking our social responsibilities seriously. Um, for the first time. And really that stemmed from a recognition that uh, as a bank, if we're to be a full member of the community, rather than just part of the economic fabric of society um, and seen perhaps as a necessary evil, um, we need to be more fully involved in the actual issues that are facing the community as a whole. So it's turning, acknowledging that we've got a wider part to play than just in the economic fabric of society. Um, at first, uh, when we first started out this journey, our commitment was really focused on 
the environment because um, that was probably a topical thing at the time um, and being sustainable and uh, and you know I think we've done quite well in that we, we've we've currently voted as a, as a group we've voted the most sustainable bank in the world and we won the Sunday Star Times most environmentally aware bank you know and that is something we we've set ourselves targets and we've tried to achieve them but later on came the realization that actually sustainability uh, is wider than just environmental and that in, in if we define sustainability as do we want to still be in business in 100 years time for example or 151 years in our case um, it's got to have social, cultural and economic as well as environmental dimensions to it. And so we've broadened our, um, our objectives and our targets. So that was our first learning really is that sustainability is broader. Secondly, when we've got involved in community issues, it has taken us a while to find our, our feet, if you like, and find um, a place for us to stand that, that is meaningful for us. Um, we've, the issues that we've been involved in over time um, have been, I think, with respect, a little bit random, partly driven by, you know, the, the interests or passion of people on the board or the chief executive of the time, um, and also driven by the sort of a reactive um, approach to so many causes that come and so many needy things that need help and need money. Um, so we've, we've ended up with a portfolio of things that we're involved in that, are, that, as I say, with in hindsight, look a little bit random. And so what we've set ourselves an objective to try and do is to, first of all, to try and do things that are, um, do fewer things, but do them better. Because we felt that we're spreading ourselves too thinly, we're not really making a difference on any one thing we're doing. So let's try and do fewer things and do them better. And secondly, let's try and find things that have some relevance to us. And I'm not uh, holding this out as um, something necessary that other people should follow, but in our case, we've, we've tried to say, we can't fix all the problems of the world, but what are the things that, as a financial services provider, have some relevance to us? So, for example, one of our more recent initiatives is uh, financial literacy. Um, it, it is, you know, one of the big social issues that does affect us uh, is that a large proportion of our client base um, don't have enough money. And secondly, with the money they do have, they're not well equipped to deal with it. They've had no financial education, uh, through through their life, um, there's enormous temptations and things put in their way to uh, to lead them off the narrow path, and uh, and there's very little resources that uh, are out there to help them manage the money they do have. So, um, managing your money is something that is uh, that we're working quite hard with. We've uh, we've got a joint venture with another university, sorry, um, uh, to build a centre for financial literacy. We engage all our staff by training staff to be able to give managing your money workshops in their own community or in, in clients' workplaces, and that's been tremendously successful. So for me, that was finding something that is actually more relevant to us than, for example, other causes which might be uh, you know, cleaning up beaches and things which the staff get engaged with but, but aren't really highly correlated to banking. Um, that's been something that's, uh, that, as I said, is a relatively you know, recent sort of thing that we've evolved to. And I guess the last point uh, I'd, I'd say that from learning from our point of view is that um, is finding things, and we've started to find things where the expertise we have, such as it is, it's not uh, very broad, but you know, in financial um, financial expertise that we have within the bank, um, can be applied as part of the solution sometimes to solving some of these problems. So, can we find ways and means to get involved? provide some expertise that we've got as well as the money that we've got and leverage the whole outcome. And so a couple of examples that I should just mention. One is um, with getting involved with things like public-private partnerships, particularly where they have a social outcome. Social housing is one that springs to mind. Um, as Russell mentioned, it's a, a huge issue for New Zealand. Um, we, we think that there is a role to play for the private sector to get involved. Um, we have uh, interesting projects um, underway in, in Australia. Um, there's, a, there's a big one underway at the moment where the, it's a partnership between all three sectors and uh, should deliver fantastic outcomes. And one of the interesting things about public-private partnerships is that if you structure them properly, you can provide really interesting incentives for people. So one of the ones that we're involved in in Australia uh, is the redevelopment of a very, very rundown uh, sort of social housing um, estate, virtually a ghetto, 
with bars and the windows and graffiti and whatever, where it's all going to be redeveloped. There'll be the same number of social houses built um, as there are now, will be completely newly built. But in addition, there'll be um, a, a very large group of private sector houses, which the consortium of which we're part, will develop and sell. And the social housing will just be all scattered throughout it, indistinguishable. For us to make money, when I say us, the consortium of investors that we're representing, for us to make money, we have to be able to sell those houses to people. For us to be able to sell those houses to people at a, at a profit or whatever to make our money back, it's got to be a nice place to live. So in other words, we're highly incentivised to make that a nice place to live. If it's a nice place to live, it'll be a fantastic outcome for the people living in the social houses. So unlike you know, many property developers, we're building mosques and uh, you know, early childhood education centres and things scattered throughout the thing because we want to make this a really viable uh, development. That is something which may be anathema to people. That, you know, it sort of seems to a lot of people that the private sector shouldn't get involved in, in what should be a public service delivery. But um, we think that, you know, that this is an example which uh, can deliver better outcomes because of the, the money and the expertise um, brought to it. And the last one I wanted to mention is social bonds or social impact bonds, again, well advertised by Geraint. Thank you very much. Um, that's a relatively new thing worldwide. There's been a couple done in the UK. Um, there's one happening right now in New York, which a lot of interesting stuff that seems to be happening. Um, the, uh, and we've, we've got one underway, or in the process of being put together again in New South Wales with um, New South Wales Government Department. And again, this is again trying to bring our expertise, financial expertise, and say there are pools of investors out there. There are people who want to donate money, then there are people who want to invest money who may or may not have a certain degree of uh, benevolent approach to it. We think there's quite a large pool of money that could be tapped if we set up something as a bond uh, where the proceeds of the bond go to invest in a program to address a specific issue and the issue's got to be defined and measurable um, and give really measurable outcomes and have a really good provider who can deliver those outcomes and then the basis of the bond that we're doing in Australia will be the government will pay based on performance at the end of say five years um, depending on the outcome. So in other words, if we're, in this case, we're looking at holding families together and providing family support so that kids don't end up uh, in court or truant or whatever, if we have measures around that, at the end of five years, the government will pay an outcome uh, based on the success of that because it will have saved so much money to the system that it's a fantastic investment for the government. So if we structure that up as in a bond, we'll be able to tap into people who might want to give money. There's some bonds which might be more charitable, others might provide some sort of return, uh, but might tick a box for a super fund or whatever who needs to make a certain type of social investment. That is a new and interesting thing, which again, as I say, Westpac will put money into it ourselves, but more importantly, we'll put our financial expertise. So the four things for us have been, you know, the, the learning, first of all, a, a few years ago now, that a business has to be fully part of its community, um, that sustainability has several dimensions. It's important to, we think, uh, to focus our efforts on things that can make a difference. And, uh, and things that are probably relevant to us in some way or other. Relevance could be defined geographically or could be defined in our case by a business or by the interest or experience people have had. And lastly, using skills, experience and the passion of the people who work for us um, can really leverage up the commitment you make. One of the spin-offs that we get is um, the tremendous um, uh, improvement in staff morale from being involved in these things. The staff love to get involved in these things and uh, it and give something back to the community. So from our point of view, we're, we're on a journey. We're only scratching the surface. We've got an awful lot to learn, I think, ourselves, and we haven't got a lot to teach other people, um, but a lot more to do. Um, but we feel we're on a good track. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you David. Frank, I now call upon you. Thank you. John. Um, look, uh, as John introduced me, uh, I'm a partner in the uh, commercial law firm Battle of Finlay, uh, and w I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about uh, what it, we think is probably, in the scheme of things, a very small contribution to building a community of impact, uh, but something which is very real to us and uh, something we're very proud of. Um, as I said, Buttle Finlay is a large commercial law firm. Uh, our roots go back over 100 years. Uh, we have 41 partners and uh, about 250 staff uh, spread through offices in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. In 2005, 
we had a feeling that the time was right for us to give more back to the community than what we had been. Um, we had honoured requests for small donations from a, a very diverse um, range of, uh, of organisations, uh, often with a connection with our partners or staff or clients. Uh, but these were small things and um, I think a bit like uh, David was saying about Westpac, they, they had a degree of randomness about them. Um, and we felt that it was time to do something a bit more in terms of quantum, um, but also to give our uh, contributions uh, a bit more structure and focus. And we wanted to do something that involved our staff as well. And uh, what we ended up settling on uh, was to create a charitable trust, the Buttle Finlay Child Health Foundation, uh, which stands alongside our business, it carries its name, uh, but is uh, separate. Uh, it um, has four trustees who are all partners of the firm. Um, and um, the, the trust is managed from within the firm's management, uh, although uh, is technically separate. Um, we decided that um, we wanted to um, support one cause uh, rather than a variety of causes, uh, and we decided on child health. Uh, we thought that that was something that matched our regional structure in that uh, each office could identify with the children's hospitals and their centres, uh, and um, it gave it a little bit more purpose uh, to go forward with. Um, and so what we did financially was to create a structure whereby um, the firm uh, made an annual fixed financial contribution to the trust um, and then matched staff contributions dollar for dollar. Um, the idea of involving the staff um, was reasonably pivotal to the, the whole thing uh, and uh, because we also wanted the trust to be very much part of our culture. Uh, and we just couldn't do that without the staff. Um, so what we decided on was we asked the staff to make a $3 a week contribution uh, to the trust, um, which would be deducted from their pay. Um, $3 at that time was sort of roughly the, the cost of a uh, cup of coffee. Um, and we sort of tried to sell it on that basis. Um, we got a very high take up from the staff and um, used that, uh, those funds then to, uh, as a basis to go forward. Um, we created relationships with the hospitals, uh, and particularly in Auckland Kids First, and um, explained what we were about and what we could do. Um, our financial contribution uh, obviously was relatively small compared with um, other, some other organisations, um, but what we thought we could achieve uh, which would be useful to the hospitals was we're in a position to deal with applications very quickly. Uh, we could do it almost on the same day basis for urgent uh, applications, uh, write a check and deal with the issue. So most of the applications that have come in um, have really been around equipment and uh, where it's failed, uh, it's you know, the replacement's unbudgeted for and uh, we've dealt with those things um, and um, I think, you know, made a useful contribution where we can. <coughs> um, in addition, um, we've encouraged the staff to participate in non-financial contributions. Uh, and so we um, have annual collections for Easter uh, in the offices and uh, bring out presents. Uh, some of the staff do um, decorations and come out and decorate a ward, uh, things like that in Wellington. Um, the staff had rosters where they'd go out and read to children in the wards. Uh, and um, that's been very successful as well. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult issue with our staff uh, introducing them to the system where we obviously very much want them to participate in it, but obviously can't put them under pressure to do so. Uh, and um, I think one of the challenges that we're about to address now is that 
the staff, the young people, the graduates that are coming through have a quite different view on many of these things uh, the people we were dealing with 10 years ago. Or, um, and, uh, you know, we just need to understand that a little bit more and um, work out exactly what uh, they're looking to achieve out of it. Um, but certainly the firm takes great pride uh, in what we've done and what we've set up. Um, and um, it's, as I said, it's been very important to the firm. Um, it's very much a cultural thing for us. Uh, we've um, been very careful that it's not part of our marketing as such, uh, although we're proud of it and uh, don't hide it. Uh, we don't want it to become a gimmick for us. Uh, don't want it to be part of sort of advertising or marketing, uh, as I say. Um, and I think we've achieved that pretty well. Um, so it's um, been quite successful. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been an interesting exercise for us. Uh, it's now seven years uh, since we set it up. Um, we probably will review it again uh, in the next year or so. Uh, review it not in the sense of reducing it, uh, but probably, if anything, perhaps increasing our financial contribution to it, um, and also uh, just perhaps working through it more with the staff. Um, at the moment, we feel that the staff have lost uh, some connection with it, and um, we're not sure if it's the way we're administering it or whether just our staff uh, are different people, whether it's Gen Y or something like that. Um, so that's really uh, our story. Um, it's um, very small in the scheme of things, obviously, uh, but it's um, something that's been important to us and uh, we're very pleased to share it with you. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Frank. I think both David and Frank from different sizes of organisations, I think, point out the problem that beset, I think, the business community, and that is the requests that come in from all sources and all areas, and that need to occasionally sift those through and decide what is of true value. And I guess what we're trying to say today here is clearly you know, we need to look at what, is the, what are the big issues that business should really be trying to go for. I'd now like to ask, introduce um, or to ask Jocelyn to take the stand. Jocelyn, of course, who is really symptomatic, I guess, of a connection with this building. And I have to say that the Stevenson Foundation and Middlemore have been almost synonymous over the years. Jocelyn. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Ah. <laughs> um, John's sort of blown some of my cover, I guess, so I can slip to the bottom of the page of my speech. But I have been born, reared, raised, and lived most of my life in East and South Auckland until more recently. So I have seen um, great development in this area of the country from a young child walking across the farmlands at Otara with my father before he started the infrastructure and construction on the roading before the um, state housing went in there. Um, the development and, and building of the, the wonderful shopping centre at Manukau City, which was a very new concept in New Zealand. So learning to drive through the back farm roads of um, Botany down to South Auckland and Manukau. So I, I feel I have quite a passion for this region of the country. Um, and like my previous two speakers, with the Charitable Trust, there's some fairly fundamental issues and questions we have to ask ourselves. And one of them is, how do we fix the world with a limited budget or limited funds? This was something that Dave Stevie, a cousin of mine, who's also a fellow trustee of the Charitable Trust, sat down and talked about a few years ago. We seem to be bombarded at the time with all sorts of requests for charities, sponsorships, group donations, heart-wrenching stories from individuals, and so on, all good causes across the country. How do you pick and choose who you give to? Um, we seem to be drip-feeding a multitude of good causes at the time, but we realised this drip-feeding wasn't really helping anyone in the long term. So from there, we decided that we would put the checkbook in the bottom drawer for a year or two and go out and do our research and 
focus in on areas of where we wanted to assist and try and make some ground with. Um, we also decided that many of our businesses or business units were based in and around South Auckland. A lot of the family lived in the area too. So we decided that we would shrink the elephant to um, a South Auckland size or Manic House, Manic County's Manukau. Once again, we found going out into the community, there were many organisations offering all levels of support to a wide range of need bases. We soon, soon learnt that we hadn't shrunk the elephant, in fact, it had grown to be a herd. We all know the diversity of the ethnic groups living in this region, and they all have their own specific issues. We all know that the region has a high percentage of population that's from the low socioeconomic group. Housing, health, education, truancy, gangs, drugs, violence, the list goes on and on and on. Where do we start? We decided that since we only had a small fund to play with, that we would like to help in areas that put the ambulance at the top of the cliff rather than the bottom. And we felt morally bound to our younger generations. We needed to protect them in every sense of the word. They are our future workforce, leaders, teachers, doctors, and good citizens. We need to educate them. We were very lucky at the time to be put in touch through a business associate with the newly formed Springboard Trust. Now, I apologise here for targeting this particular trust, but it's part of my story. Um, this trust, trust had just been set up or sorry, had set up a leadership, sorry, strategic leadership program for primary school principals in low decile schools in the South Auckland region. And I quote, Springboard Trust assists educational leaders and their communities to grow in a strategic, structured and scalable way through capacity building and strategic partnerships drawn from New Zealand businesses and, phil and philanthrop philanthropic community. Um, Springboard Trust's vision is to dramatically improve the life skills and thereby the lives of young New Zealanders. This sounded perfect to us. This is what we were looking for. So we opted to choose them as one of our or, or to benefit from um, our funding. Mainly because by helping principals do their jobs better, we will and help to improve schooling. And with a relatively for, small financial commitment, we could assist with ongoing gains through our schooling system. Then we arrived at the dilemma, that's all very well, but to improve the education, but what about the low standard of health and wellbeing within our community? Around the same time, Dave and I were invited to attend a meeting at the South Auckland Health Foundation to listen to a very passionate and enthusiastic presentation from the board, but particularly Grant, sitting here somewhere, there. Yep. The topic of the presentation was a concept for a learning facility based at Middlemore Hospital around the specific health requirements for the South Auckland region. This was a no-brainer for Dave and I. We both very quickly realised that we wanted to be a part of this. We undertook and are proud to continue with our grandfather's legacy and sponsor the Chair for Health Innovation and Improvement at Kawawatia, Middlemore. That meeting was a little over three years ago, as I recall. From that, Jonathan Gray was appointed to the chair and arrived in New Zealand roughly two, two and a half years ago. And, and uh, just in time to oversee the construction of this wonderful facility here at Kawawatia. And his uh, journey began as a, in New Zealand as a leader in health and innovation and an improvement. Already we, and I say we, is firstly as a Kiwi, but I feel myself a member of the Kaoa Tia team, sorry, excuse me, um, have hosted a number of world-renowned professionals, most recently Professor Sir Mansell Aylwood, who has written and presented the White Paper series, 
and that's all around child poverty and what have you, as we're discussing this morning. By narrowing down the field and forming partnerships within our chosen area of support, we feel we have started to eat the elephant. We maintain ongoing involvement with all our recipients and achieve greater long-term satisfaction as funders, but also, in putting it quite crudely or bluntly, we're also getting a bigger bang for our buck. Finally, I would just like to say that as we live in a small country, and I believe we cannot wholly rely on the government to fix all our ailments, they neither have the answers nor the funding to do so. We as corporate citizens have much to offer. I feel it is our responsibility, and I take from Jonathan's words here, to strengthen our connections and build new partnerships, to develop sustainable initiatives that make a difference to the health and well-being of our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jocelyn. I think uh, the Stevenson Foundation undoubtedly have been a marvellous supporters going back, but particularly with Coatea, as Jocelyn said, I think she is very much part of this family and we certainly enjoy always seeing her here. I may say, and Jocelyn refers to the fact that uh, she, being a South Auckland family and growing up here, when the foundation was, my foundation was founded here, the South Auckland Health Foundation or the Middlemore Foundation, it was because they thought I was a South Auckland as well, and having lived in South Auckland for 35 years, I really feel part of it too. Alan Freeth, thank you very much. Good morning. So I'm well and truly from the dark side, unlike my banker friend here who's wearing a spanker pinstripe, I'm wearing my Gordon Gecko uh, double-breasted suit. <laughs> Greed is good, or so they say. Look, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm always grateful when people are gracious enough uh, to listen to me, so thank you. And John, thank you for that introduction. There are some who say that the business of business is business and it has no role beyond commerce in the activity of making money for shareholders. Uh, and that was brought home to me in 2005 when within a few days or weeks of taking over as Chief Executive of Telstra Clear, I shut down the pornography channels on our TV service. The reaction at the time was fierce and unexpected. That bastion of progressive thinking and social conscience, the National Business Review, and that was a joke, <laughs> <coughs> showed a rather unflattering photograph of me on the front page with a large caption pro proclaiming chief censor. The associated article then qu quoted the head of the shareholders association, Bruce Shepherd, saying I had no right to make those types of decisions. In his view, my mandate was to make money for shareholders, uh, and that was all. And this type of nonsense crowded the other media as well. That was apart from the Christian Science Monitor, where I was poster boy for the month, uh, <laughs> I must say. It's a rather strange experience. <laughs> I won't bore you with the details of the decision of why I made that in business and ethical terms, um, but a little later we made a similar decision, when, but much far easier decision, when we joined the DIA scheme and blocked internet access to New Zealand customers of child pornography sites. While the decision was easy, the consequences of that action in the context of the freedom of the internet uh, in my company were complex for business reasons. Sadly, I have to tell you, on the night we blocked that site, there were 21,000 attempts in New Zealand to access child pornography uh, sites around the world. I don't know if it was multiple attempts or individual people. But the decision came down to the fact that no one can defend this type of evil, and it was the right thing to do. The right thing to do. And the question of why children, health and welfare counts, and why business should be interested and involved, boils down to that. It's the right thing to do. And fortunately for chief executives accused of playing in social policy, the hard, hard evidence, the hard numbers, and the economics for we support the statement. And I don't intend to repeat those numbers today. We've heard of, of some of those. And in that respect, I really do want to acknowledge the leadership of Dr. Russell Wells, Jonathan Boston, uh, in the expert advisory group in what I believe is a very fine publication 
uh, based on empirical research with great recommendations. But there is one figure that Russell mentioned, 3% of GDP, $6 billion each year into poor child outcomes, covering everything from poverty to abuse to youth suicide. We're one of the highest in the OECD in youth suicide. Anyone got an idea what the youngest youth suicide victim in New Zealand was? Six years old. I said to teachers just recently that six billion, it didn't actually win me any votes, was a small, was a huge sum compared to the 174 million that government was trying to save on increasing class sizes. Yet, ironically, we do not see teachers protesting about the 22% of children or more of the latest figures living in poverty and our high suicide rates. Protests aside, I as a business leader know that unless I address the issues of community challenges such as children, health, community, education, the poverty gap, it is going to cost my business and cost my shareholders in the long term. About a week ago, two weeks ago, there was an editorial in the listener on your report and I was slightly amused when it said we don't have poverty in New Zealand like third world poverty because I thought if you're hungry, does it matter where you really are uh, in, in the world? But certainly in line with some of the other speakers, I, that could be true, but I believe we're headed to a community or a nation of gated communities and ghettos unless we do something about this. So the challenge, in my view, for business is not should we, not should we, but how far can we go legitimately to support programs and activities by using other people's money, namely our shareholders. Many of those shareholders who provide capital for business will say it's the government's job to address these issues. They as individuals have already paid taxes. We as enterprises create wealth and pay taxes again. We employ people, we support their families in doing so, and that's enough, perhaps. But what they conveniently forget is that businesses create what economists call externalities. We create dependencies, we create costs that are often borne by the whole society. And some of you may remember the famous essay by Garrett Hardin, Tragedy of the Commons, in which he quotes a factory that grabs profit for itself, but spreads the cost of pollution across the community. And so if no man is an island, then in my view the same applies to a business. In my view, only the most unenlightened and cynical business person could claim the contrary. However, I'm not sure if I believe nor if I have the capacity to have a responsibility as an individual or an organisation to be my brother's keeper on an individual basis. I'm sure the world would be a better place if that was true, but according to evolutionary biologists, of which I was once one, the only reason I'd jump in to save the drowning man is the belief that he'd do the same for me. However, as a business, I do believe we have a responsibility for being part of the communities and nations and ensuring we support democracy, human rights, protect the weak, and ensure that programs and societies do this collectively. Oh yes, I am part of the dark side, and yes, I do believe in the market, but as an ideal. I saw a film over the weekend called Margin Call that some of you may have seen. It's about Lehman Brothers who brought the global financial crisis on us. Sadly, that film epitomises the worst of what people think about big business. I'm not sure where in New Zealand bus big business got a bad name, but we need big business, and the bigger the better, because it creates wealth and it has resources to do things. As I say, I believe in the market, but as an ideal, I know it fails. The people it fails the most dramatically are the vulnerable and those without a voice. And so from a shareholder wealth perspective, I do believe it's a legitimate part of my business to support communities and social initiatives. And over the seven and a half years uh, that I've been at Telstra Clear, we've been involved in partnerships mainly around children and youth. So Save the Children, Foundation for Youth Development, CASPA, Stella Trust, Crime Stoppers, Howard League, Super Clubs, that's the cyberbullying organisation, Salvation Army and Plunkett have been some of our most recent partnerships. Also through the work that David talked about uh, and the leadership at AUT of Vivian Bridgewater and Luke Shorter, uh, we are trying to promote the concept of social impact bonds. We think that's a very clever way 
in a very business-like way of becoming involved in good work. The contra of not being involved means the cost of doing business is considerable. Crime, lack of skilled workforce, social disruption and the like. Those social costs just drain wealth from a nation. And I think about it like I think about my telecommunications business. Uh, I add about 67,000 new customers a month. Thank you for those of you who are customers of ours. We appreciate it. But I lose about 2,500 a month as well. It's called churn. So all that work to bring new customers in goes out the back door. I think about this in the same way. All that good work that gets done and government puts money in without addressing these issues is just going through the floorboards. I believe from an ethical perspective, it's an obligation for business to be good citizens and to ensure their activities are a cause for good. Only the most ignorant, ignorant, uncivilised and primitive societies fail to look after the vulnerable elements of their society. And sadly, I have to say, given the statistics about child abuse, domestic violence and poverty in New Zealand, one would begin to question whether we don't come close to that description. Business not only has an obligation to do good, but business has an obligation to provide leadership and to speak out. Sadly, at a weekend event, I won't say where because it was meant to be in Chatham Held Rules, but let's just say it had very senior business people of New Zealand. There was a big economic debate going on, and I got very bored and very angry and stood up and said, let's talk about poverty and children. So I gave a big speech using some of your, your statistics. Thank you. I sat down, and the next question was... Let's talk about imputation credits on tax between Australia and New Zealand. Why would they be interested? They weren't hungry, and for God's sake, they were staying in the Hilton. <laughs> Why would they be interested? And I was really amazed. Again, no one would speak out at that point, but they're willing to come up to me afterwards uh, and say, well, it's really good, I'm involved in such and such. It's my belief that we are on the eve of a new process, and I think it's really simple. If business won't become involved, they don't have a choice because there's a new model a coming. And that model is underpinned by technology that places the power to speak out and act against governments and corporations in the hands of the socially isolated, the vulnerable and the young. And I am, of course, talking about social media and those little square things you have on your desks everywhere today. I spoke two weeks ago at the New Zealand Autism Conference. I think they asked me because they think I'm a high-functioning autistic, which is slightly true. <laughs> it is actually true, but anyway, I won't go there. And I think they want me to be the poster boy, but I'm trying to dodge that. <laughs> Business, and I spoke on this issue, the geeks are going to take over the world. They are. Uh, who has the most ability to connect millions of people like that around the world? the Asperger kid in Fongaray who had a million computers under his control and ripped off 200 million US out of the system. Not for himself, he put it in his bank account. You might remember him, his first name was Owen. We employed him to go around boardrooms to give lectures about how to rip off computers um, and scare business people to buy our security systems. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so for the first time, I believe, we're facing rapid and spontaneously forming collective consciousness as a true power on a global scale. It is activism as we've never seen it and never will see it again. So the implications are significant. I don't have time to talk about those today. But I am saying to businesses, unless you're prepared to be involved, it's going to be forced on you. So if being human is not enough, then to survive and prosper in the new world, business and business leaders will have to step up to be involved in the affairs of communities, nations and people. But it's more than that. They should care. They should speak out. And they should do so because it's the right thing to do. And it is as simple, as human and as decent as that. Thank you. Uh, can I just join in that in my congratulations to this conversation and this dialogue? Uh, the fact is this is quite rare that we're doing what we're doing here today, and the extent to which we're getting a crossover in what is commercial drivers and the understanding of the environment in which they work, and also the social innovation environment and the requirement for people who are working within the kind of softer end of the social spectrum 
to understand what drives business choices and to understand how you can actually dovetail what you're doing with those things. And I think if there is the, if um, having the opportunity here to try and give you a reflection on themes that have been predominant in today's discussion, I think one of the first things I want to say is business and social innovation are friends of each other. The capacity of business to actually add its expertise, to add the value that is specific to what it's very good at, and to open itself up to the possibility that that might be enjoined with social innovation thinking and people in the social spectrum who actually require the expertise business comes, but they also have a degree of connectivity with their communities. Bringing those two things together is a very powerful mix indeed. Um, Geraint talked in his opening conversations about the challenges to health coming forward and talked about the space in which um, really clever innovation actually delivers not only good social change but delivers commercial opportunity and Fisher and Paykel and Orion are two examples of that. I know in our own project in um, Glen Innes we have had a hackers group working for two years coming every fortnight for pizza for two hours at the, at the Point England Primary School where they've developed IP which has now been sold internationally around the world. And this is kind of um, a methodology of understanding. In fact, we in our group only have commercial partners who are also prepared to be volunteers. We're trying to create a new way of working with the business sector that enables there to be innovation in what we do. I think if you think about two really prescient moments in today's conversations and presentations. One was um, Andrew's conversation in as, uh, the intervention strategy of the police and that slide which talked about the impact of alcohol on so many dimensions of our communities. Now, if you were really smart, you'd look at something like alcohol and he gave a great example of paralleling it with the um, the campaign on smoking. If you're looking at something like alcohol and you were saying you're interested in shifting in a very large way within a generation New Zealand's attitude to excess drinking, that would be a place that you'd actually bond community, business and the health profession in order to get that kind of change. You would bring in the police, you would bring in the courts. Um, Emma talked about the fact that nearly 70% of everybody who fronts up in front of her has alcohol related to their issue that's, uh, that she has to adjudicate on. Now there is a really clear, big, difficult chestnut to be cracked, which if you brought the combined brains of commerce, the social services, the police and the courts to bear, we could change it and we could change it within a decade or 20 years. It's that kind of way to do it. Smoking tells us that's possible. If you think about the kind of economic cost that Russell Wills is talking about where by the fact that we don't do the right thing, it costs this country a significant portion of its GDP, that we are actually impeding the ability to have fit, healthy, young, adjusted children become our economic drivers of the future because we're not paying attention to the evidence and to the ability to do the right thing at the right time with people. And this is, in effect, simple in concept, complicated in delivery, but one of the great things about having business to do it together with the social sector is if business is good at one thing, it's about implementation strategy. If the social sector is, is good at many things, it's about not only implementation, but it's about analysis of why things are like they are. Now, when you hear the report of Russell Wills and the group that have put that together under Jonathan Boston's chairmanship, or dual chairmanship actually, we are right now confronted to be in a space which is not morally neutral. And that is the primary reason business doesn't work with communities. Because communities tend to work in the morally non-neutral space. Communities are advocates for their own purposes, for what they think is important to change, and they are drivers and campaigners 
often against the political wind in order to get the right thing to be done. And for business, that scares business because businesses are, for a large part, also clients and providers to government. And so you have this conundrum that sits here which actually defeats so often doing the right thing because, in fact, the sort of weight that is required to get behind a report like Russell Wills and actually say, pause here for a moment here, touch and engage for a moment. We've actually got something here of all black quality which is telling us a story about our country that if we paid attention to it and got a political consensus around it, we could actually do the thing that needs to be done. Now, that's our challenge in this context here. It's our challenge which is most um, eloquently expressed by Alan in his last where he puts his stake in the ground, whether it was about child pornography not being on their airwaves and understanding the commercial complications of making a decision like this. Bear in mind that governments respond really, really intensively and carefully to the business community. It is of the business community who could take a lead in the kind of issues that Russell has talked about but the business community has lots to lose by doing that. We need to be clear about that, and we need to be real about that. Therefore, the business community, to take a stand in a matter such as this, needs a broad coalition of support. And unless we bring broad coalitions of support around the issues that we think are big and grunty, we actually fail to deliver the outcome for us as a country. So we need, in a sense, to repoliticize and neutralize the, we need, sorry, not to repoliticize, we need to actually understand how we can gather the, the strength of business to a cause like the um, report on poverty, which is evidential, which has so much in it that we need to actually pay attention to, and we need to have a long view about how we'll do this, and to do it in such a way that business does not put its own interests at risk. A really sophisticated and clever process needs to happen in order for that to happen. And it needs to be led. And so when Alan and others have a clarion call for doing this stuff, we need a community which is not cynical to that, but actually gets up and gets behind it. And we need business institutions, like the former New Zealand Institute, which uh, ran the program to do with more sna less snakes, more ladders, about e-learning. There are enormous gains to be had by having a dovetailing of the business and the social innovation groupings. We talked about skill sets needing to have the expertise in order to actually do this stuff well. Now we know in the health sector, the health sector is profoundly populated with people with some of the highest levels of expertise of any kind in the country. We know also in the business sector that where you get the leadership of the caliber we've seen with the four participants here today, you've got grunt and ability to actually make things happen. We need to foster these relationships into the future. There is, I think, a elephant in this room, and it's not quite the one that we were eating with the Stevenson presentation. This elephant in the room is about the uh, community of interest. It's the elephant in the room which actually says that in a community of of South Auckland, where we have such strong Māori and Pacific um, groupings here, and Asian groupings, they're not present much in the room here. So we need to get that elephant into this room. And it needs to happen in a clever way. Because for all of us who are working in these areas, where we have real uh, coalface and interface with the people that we're hoping to support, those communities need to be present in these conversations and these debates. In fact, much more of these debates and conversations need to be in the place of those communities. And it's a, a strikingly difficult thing to do because this is most familiar to us. This is the territory we, we operate best in. But in fact, the communities that we wish to support operate in quite different territory and we have to get in face to face with that territory to understand it. Andrew, as the leader of the police here, has come up with a strategy here which has been born out of face-to-face, coalface 
feedback from his own people in his own place. The kind of school things we're trying in, in Glen Innes and Tamaki are born out of a community of parents talking with their teachers and saying, facing the dark truth that unless something changed, their kids would fail like they had failed. It is getting to those dark places where the communities of interest are genuinely face to face with those of us capable of bringing networks and resources in support of their kaupapa, that that's the place where you'll get the engine of change working most effectively. And to do that, we need a humility, which is not necessarily the thing that we carry in our briefcase when we carry $100,000 to be able to give to somebody. But we need it in order to effectively to get at the change processes that are required for us as New Zealanders to be in alliance with one another to make this the place for everybody. Now, that's a learning that the people on the street have and which we need to practice. And none of it is easy. I just want to finally kind of um, talk about why Kawawatea makes so much sense in this process. Because what you've created here is a venue for a conversation that might not happen in another place. You've actually opened up the opportunity within people's experience and to be challenged and to be educated about what's required to fix big and grunty issues. The thing you've yet to do is to have that community writ large inside this building at the levels important enough to make this interchange authentic and to, defer, to deliver a great and different thing for this country. And that is what you're building. And I all respect to the, to the place here about the way you're going about that. But when we come back here in five years' time, having actually got to grips with some of these grunty issues like alcohol, and the child poverty issues that are in Russell's process, we want this uh, auditorium filled with this community who have been the engine and energetic co-constructors of change in this place. That will, sh that will mark us as having this day provided something in that future that will have done something very remarkable in this community. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tātou katoa, kia ora. <clears throat> now I'm going to invite you to um, uh, take time off for lunch and at quarter to one you will have the opportunity to come and listen to one of the great communicators of health in the world today, Don Berwick. And I welcome you back here at quarter to one. Thank you very much. <laughs>